Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Fox 2020 tutorial on what can theoretical computer science contribute to the discussion of consciousness. This tutorial is based on a research project that Manuel and I have been working on for the past several years. Avram's sleeping experts algorithms were just what was needed for the unconscious process of learning that is critical for consciousness in our model. I will begin with an overview of our model, the Conscious Turing Machine, or the CTM. Manuel will present more details, discuss the feeling of consciousness in the CTM, the hard problem for pain, and give some explanatory examples. We will end with some questions, problems, and suggestions for future directions. What is consciousness? Roughly speaking, consciousness or conscious awareness is everything you pay attention to awake or dreaming, but not dreamless sleep. It's what you see, what you hear, what you feel, what you smell, what you taste, your joys, fears, sorrows, pains, but most especially it's your inner private uh, speech. It's what gives you the sense of self. Until about 30 years ago, the scientific study of consciousness was taboo. Then in 1988, cognitive neuroscientist Bernard Barras published a cognitive theory of consciousness where he discusses the global workspace theory. And then in 1990, with the advent of the fMRI technology, neuroscientists were able to look inside non-intrusively the brain and see the activity when people were performing conscious tasks. In 1995, Francis Crick wrote the Astonishing Hypothesis where he talks about neural correlates as a way of understanding consciousness. Well, there are various approaches to the study of consciousness. Uh, for millennia, uh, there's been the philosophical approach, going back to Confucius, Plato, but today there are many contemporary uh, philosophers who are looking into the study of consciousness. And I mentioned to uh, Charles Dennett, uh, who's a functionalist, and David Chalmers, who's a phenomenologicalist, and they uh, sort of represent the two sides of the spectrum of the philosophical discussion and actually the broader discussion of consciousness. Um, Charles Dennett sometimes says that consciousness is an illusion and that's not so flippant as it may seem. And let me give you an example. For example, you have, when you look out at a scenery, you have the feeling you have the whole scene. Maybe if you're looking at the scene of Pittsburgh behind me, you have the sense of the whole scene. And if it was really there, basically all you will see is a really small section at any one time. And through the cods of your eye, you put together a whole picture of the whole scene. So you have the illusion of the whole. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. The psychological approach uh, maybe starts with Freud and James at the turn of the uh, last century, the end of the uh, 19th century. Um, neural correlates, as I mentioned, Francis Crick and uh, Christoph Koch looked at neural oscillations and spikes when um, one is doing conscious activity. Then Julia uh, Tononi and later with Koch um, talks about measures of consciousness. There's a theory called integrated information theory, which has some axioms for this measurement. It's sort of based on um, Shannon information theory and they have a measure phi, which then um, we're actually coming from the cognitive neuroscience perspective and we're very influenced by Bernard Barr, Stanislav Dehaene, Alan Baddeley. And I'd like to mention that their work actually in turn was influ influenced by a lot of work on cognition, much of which happened at Carnegie Mellon with Alan Newell, Herb Simon, Roger Eddy, and John Anderson. And they take an architectural approach, which is very much the approach that we are gonna take here. Well, what can mathematics and theoretical computer science contribute to the discussion of consciousness? Well, we too want to understand consciousness. We want to give a simple mathematical model to help us get this understanding. This is something that uh, makes sense for us, that we seem to do quite well, um, and to take complicated theories and sort of look at the essence. 
Uh, we want to give a good definition of chunk. You may know that in 1950, the psychologist George Miller talked about the magic number seven plus or minus two. And what he's trying to say is that that's about the amount of information that you can keep in your short-term memory at any moment of time. It influenced the length of, of telephone numbers at, at one time, so forth. So what is a chunk? It could be a word, it could be a digit, it could be a poem where you know at first you have in your consciousness the first phrase and that leads to the second phrase and the third phrase and so forth, and then you can spew out a whole poem. So what we'd like to give a formal definition of this informal notion of chunk. We want to distinguish between simulating and experiencing. We want properties of consciousness to be emergent, not programmed in. We are not looking for a model of the brain, nor of learning or cognition. We are looking for a model of consciousness. We are looking for simplicity, not complexity. And of course, we would like to build such a conscious AI, and we're working with our colleague, Jean-Louis Villacros. In 1995, the philosopher David Chalmers uh, started to talk about the easy and hard problems for consciousness. And what Paul Chalmers says is that the easy problems of consciousness are those that seem directly susceptible to the standard methods of cognitive science, whereby a phenomenon explains in terms of the computational or neural mechanisms. This is called the functional or access consciousness. But the really hard problem of consciousness is the problem of experience. When we think and perceive, there is a whir of information processing, but there's also a subjective aspect, and that's called phenomenal consciousness. And um, I think what trauma is opposing the easy and hard problems this way sort of framed uh, the discussion for philosophers and neuroscientists, um, the discussion of consciousness. Um, and renewed the discussion of the explanatory gap, one might, the explanatory gap between the solving the easy problem and solving the hard problem. Well, the hard problem is usually associated with the word qualia, the feeling of what it is like, the feeling of what it is like to be a bat. Many focus on what it feels like when you see red. And when I show this red here, Different people have different feelings depending on your background, your experience, or where you live, east or west. Here is our formulation of the easy and hard problems. We say the easy problem for us is to make a robot that simulates feelings, for example, of pain and joy. And the hard problem is to make a robot that truly experiences these feelings of pain and joy. And here you have Sophia simulating emotions. Um, she's going through a gamut, of, but she ends up with an expression of pleasure and joy. Although Sophia's expressions may simulate pleasure, she has acute anhedonia and philosophers may say she's a zombie. In humans, anhedonia is the reduced ability to experience pleasure. It's often uh, caused by damage to nucleus accumbens. Um, there are a number of neuroscientists who study pleasure. Um, two that I'd like to mention are Berridge and Kringlebach. Um, th what they have done is they've uh, sort of taken pleasure and, and, uh, and, and get it into three components. They say there are three major components of pleasure. There's the wanting part, the anticipated pleasure. There's the liking part, the consumatory pleasure. Oh, how wonderful that was when I just had that bar of chocolate. And then the learning aspects. And another thing that they've done is debunk earlier studies, which says that we actually do have a pleasure center in the brain. And by uh, poking it, you can increase the do uh, dopamine and you would get more and more pleasure. And there were studies where rats were induced to start um, poking or exciting this a pleasure center. And they did it so much that they finally died of a starvation. Uh, what Burge and Kringlebach would say was that was really um, just addiction. It was the wanting part of, of pleasure. It really wasn't pleasure. 
So they simply point out to the fact that some of these pleasure centers are really tied up with addiction. Okay, you can also see uh, robots on the web simulating pain. And here, if you look at this particular YouTube, which I'm not gonna show, the pain seems to be so excruciating that it's painful to watch. Okay, but nevertheless, this robot has pain asymbolia and pain asymbolia in humans is a condition in which pain is experienced without unpleasantness. And there could be insensitivity to pain or indifference to pain. And Manuel will talk about this phenomenon in his part. Our view of consciousness is that consciousness is a property of all properly organized computing systems, whether made of flesh and blood or metal and silicon. And our thesis is the architecture of these systems is what makes them conscious. Uh, later on, I will add to this, just the it's not just the architecture, but it has to do with the processors and the dynamics as well. And we'll talk about that shortly. Many cognitive neuroscientists agree though that consciousness has to do, uh, do with the architecture of the brain. And our architecture explains the brain at a very high level of abstraction at a level well above that of neurons. We'll give a formal definition of a machine for consciousness. We call it the conscious Turing machine, the CTM or conscious AI. We define consciousness in that model, then point out properties of consciousness in the model. After all, these will be definitions and we'll have to give explanatory reasons why the model may uh, have the experience of consciousness. Then we'll also talk about that aspect. We are inspired by Turing's simple yet powerful model of a computer that helps give understanding of computation. And as you know, uh, here's a small 23 state universal Turing machine that can compute anything that you can compute in the cloud or with a supercomputer. But you can get your head around the Turing machine, not the cloud. And that's inspired by Turing. We are again aiming for simplicity, not complexity. Our architecture formalizes the theater or global workspace model of cognitive neuroscientist Bernard Bars. And Bars describes awareness through a theater analogy. Consciousness for Bars, as Bars says, is like the activity of actors in a play performing on a stage of working or short-term memory, that's the STM. The inner speech actor is often on stage. Their performance is under observation by a huge audience of unconscious processes and long-term memory that are sitting in the dark, some of whom may want to get their information or their, their point of view up on the stage. This is, may have happened to you once or twice. You're at a party, you see someone you know, but for the life of you, you can't remember her name. Then, about a half hour later, when you're home, her name pops up into your consciousness. What's going on? Well, what's her name gets broadcast down to all the unconscious processors. And perhaps one processor recalls where you first met in a computer science class. It goes up to short-term memory and then gets broadcast down to all the long-term memory processors. And then another processor remembers something about what she does. Oh, she's in machine learning that gets up to short-term memory, then gets broadcast down to all the long-term processors. Her name becomes with a T that gets up to short-term memory, gets broadcast down and so forth. And about a half hour later, her name comes up to the stage to the conscious uh, short-term memory from the audience of unconscious long-term memory processors, which has been thinking, searching. The conscious self on stage doesn't know quite how or where her name was found. Um, there are many stories like this um, in uh, mathematics and history. Probably this happened to you also once or twice, hopefully more even. Um, I remember reading about this when I was a freshman in college, actually at Carnegie Tech. And Henri Poincaré tells a story about his working day and night, day and night, trying to crack a really hard mathematical problem. And then he says, luckily, a friend of his invites him on an exploratory trip, and he loves to go exploring. So that's great. So as he describes it, he says, as I was about to board a bus, the idea came to me without anything in my former thoughts seeming to have paid the way for it 
that the transformations I had used to define the Fujian functions were identical with those of non-Euclidean geometry. So what's going on here, there's these two areas of mathematics that uh, Poincaré knows very well, and he had never seen the connection before, but somehow uh, those long-term memory processes are working, the heavy duty processes that are working all the time, and the connection that they're isomorphic pops up to his consciousness. Well, here's Barrage's model of consciousness. Um, at the center, we have a working storage, and that's our short-term memory, or our stage. And at the bottom here, we have many, many long-term memory processors. That's um, the audience. On the left, we have input from the outside world, from the environment is coming through sensors like vision, hearing, and touch. And then um, from working storage or short-term memory, there's an output uh, going to the outside world by way of action and actuators. And right in the middle, there's a central executive who performs the function, let's say, of a stage manager or a, or a drama director. Now for our conscious Turing machine. We start with a tiny short-term memory. It's a read-write memory. That's our stage. And on stage, an actor can hold one chunk of information. Now that's not the seven plus or two chunks that uh, George Miller suggests, but by cycling through short-term memory, we could simulate seven plus or minus two chunks if we wish. But since we can get away with one chunk and we're aiming for simplicity, that will do for us. We also have an enormous collection of long-term memory processes. This is our audience. They are powerful, they're parallel. At first they're not connected, but eventually some of them will become connected via links. We imagine about 10 to the seventh of these. This is maybe in accordance to the 10 to the seventh uh, cortical columns in the brain, which does a lot of the heavy duty activity. We might think of this audience members as our sleeping experts, because they are indeed are the experts in one or multiple um, activities that we, we shall need. The CTM does not have an essential executive. We have found that the central executive functions can emerge naturally from the long-term memory processors from the dynamics of the CTM. So again, in terms of simplicity, we've eliminated the central executive. We have a down tree which is a very simple tree taking, that will eventually take uh, chunks from short-term memory and broadcast them down to all long-term memory processors. We have a binary up tree and that tree will uh, be what we utilize for our competitions for our sleeping experts to get their information on stage. The CTM also has input maps from the external world to the long-term memory processes. These maps take information through sensors like eyes and ears and map them to various uh, relevant processes. They also translate worldish to the internal language, the inner language of the CTM, which we call brainish. So brainish is the inner language, words and grammar are used to communicate in the inner world. It is a much richer and more expressive language than outer language, such as English or Chinese, which are used to communicate between people. Brainish contains its own inner speech, inner vision, and inner sensations expressed in brainish words and phrases called gis. Thus, brainish is able to express and manipulate images, sensations, and thoughts better than outer languages. Having such an expressive inner language is an important component of the feeling of consciousness in the CTM. And Manuel will talk more about this. Um, if you notice in our model, um, the inputs are coming directly to the long-term memory processors. They're not going through short-term memory. Again, short-term memory is really a, a folder for a chunk of information that's gonna be broadcast. Also, um, we have output maps from certain processors to actuators to affect the outside world, the environment. And again, brainish is translated into worldish in these output maps. And again, this map goes directly from the long-term memory process to the external world. So let me tell you how the uptree competition works. 
Uh, we start with all the processors put a chunk into the competition. This is information that they want to get up to short-term memory. It could be a query, an answer to a query, some other important information that they want everybody to know about. Um, so formally, we define a chunk as a six tuple. So chunk PT, the chunk that processor P puts in the competition at time, time T consists of an address of the processor. So if they're 10, 10 to the seven processors, the address may be seven digits long, uh, the time. The gist is a small amount of information that the processor wants to convey. The weight is the importance of that information that the processor is giving to that information. It's, it has a valence, plus or minus. Then the, ten, the intensity is the absolute value of the weight. Um, sort of like the pressure that the chunk has to put that, uh, that information into the competition and the mood starts off as the weight. Um, as the chunks move up the up tree, um, the address, the time, the just the weight will stay the same, but the intensities and mood will change. And let, let me give you a simple example of an up tree competition. The one we use is really not too more difficult than this. In general, we want the competition to be easy and quick. So here's a competition going up. It's somewhat slow uh, because it's a competition. Um, so let's see how this works. So at every node, what I've done is only giving you two parts of the tuple. I give you some information about the gist and something about the, the current mood. So let's see what's happening here. So it looks like here, the pain processor put a chunk into the competition. Um, and also we have the pain processor putting a chunk into the competition. Also the joy processor puts the competition into the competition and their chunks rise to a certain point where a decision has to be made in the competition, which wins the local competition here. So here we have our, our decision is going to be made on the largest absolute value of the mood. So pain has the largest absolute value here, minus five, and so it's going to win the competition. And the function that um, actually changes the mood is the sum of these two moods. So minus five plus three is minus two. So in fact, in some ways here, because there was a pain of minus five, the joy of plus three somehow mitigated the pain a bit, so the pain goes down. Now let's see ha what happens at this juncture. Pain of minus two is competing with fear of minus five. Again, the, uh, the largest absolute value of the mood here is of fear. Then fear wins out, and then the moods sum up. Minus two or minus five gives you minus seven, and that's something that you would expect. Uh, pain, more pain, and more fear together when they fear even uh, exacerbate the fear even more. So that's the, the uh, model that we use here. Uh, the competition algorithms in general have two parts to them. You have to choose the local winner and then you have to have the properties of the chunk that moves up uh, the competition tree. Uh, in general, um, the mo our model of choice is a probabilistic model and we'll, we'll talk about this later on and it has some very nice properties. So for example, most of you have looked at this competition that I gave you and will realize right away that if we um, permute some of the processors, we may get a totally different outcome even though we don't change the chunks that they uh, submit to the competition. A very nice property of the probabilistic uh Turing machine is that the winner is totally independent the probability of a winner is totally independent of the location of the processor. So one can permute the processors and that's inconsequential to the results. So that's a nice property. As soon as a chunk wins the competition and gets into short-term memory, it is immediately broadcast down to all long-term memory processors and they get this information right away. What this does uh, besides just giving general information, it gives a lot of feedback to uh, the long-term memory processors. So for example, one processor might've really had the right answer to a query, but it didn't get its, it found out it didn't get its chunk up into short-term memory. Perhaps it was too humble. 
On the other hand, maybe a processor was too egotistical or too bold and gave too much weight to its uh, chunk. And it actually got up into short-term memory, got broadcast down, and then at another turn, it found out it was wrong. Come to rescue the sleeping experts algorithm, Avram sleeping experts algorithm. So what the sleeping experts algorithm tends to do is it tends to balance things out. So for that bold processor, it will lower its weight. And for that humble processor, it'll boost its weight next time around. So that's one of the mechanisms, the learning mechanism, important learning mechanism for uh, dealing with feedback in our system. So let's uh, review some of the conscious Turing machine dynamics. First, we have inputs coming in from the external world. Uh, these are through sensors and it's, it's, they're providing information, the input maps are providing information to certain of the long-term memory processors. At each moment of time, all the processors are putting chunks into competitions. And maybe at this moment in time when fear gets this input from the external world, it puts a chunk into the competition and it actually wins. That chunk is broadcast then down to all the long-term memory processors and uh, perhaps uh, the inner speech uh, processor decides it's gonna really act on this. It's very, see something very fearful. It decides it's gonna send an output map to the external world to uh, actuate the screaming mechanism. We call this ensemble uh, predictive dynamics. So it consists of the prediction that when a, a processor puts a chunk into uh, the competition or sends a, a message to the output map, that's the kind of prediction. There's the competition that goes on and feedback either comes through the short-term memory broadcast or from input from the external world. And then internally in all the, each of the long-term memory processors, we have learning going on. And one of the major things is the sleeping experts algorithm. Now for linking. Since the speech processor responded to fierce call, a link will form between those two processors. And in general, long-term memory processor A will link up to processor B when B answers A's call. This is the Hebbian rule that neurons that fire together wire together. And importantly, linking enables conscious processing to become unconscious. So in other words, when uh, one processor responds to another, links will form over time more and more links. And so communication now can go between the unconscious processes without having to go through short-term memory. And in fact, this is what happens when we remember what's her name a half hour later, those processes are via the links, they're sending information back and forth. That's what happened to Poincaré when he was working on other things, his uh, long-term memory processes were also working furiously, get sending information back and forth. So I just gave you the cartoon version of the CTM, sort of like the Turing machine when you see a picture of a, a little box in the tape going back and forth. But we can formally define the CTM very formally as a seven tuple, the STM, LTM, down tree, up tree, links, input, output. Uh, we define the chunk, as I said before, as a six tuple formally. Uh, we talk about predictive dynamics, prediction, competition, feedback, and learning. And that's sort of part of the formal definition of the CTM. Now for definitions of consciousness in the CTM. We say that the chunk that gets into STM is the conscious content of CTM. And we say that consciousness in the CTM is the awareness, in other words, the reception by all long-term memory processors of the conscious content of CTM. The constant activity of chunks competing to get into STM and then broadcast to LTM uh, competing to get into STM and broadcast LTM create a stream of consciousness. The reasonableness of our definition of consciousness lies in the number of concepts that the model explains easily and naturally. And I'd like to share with you one. 
So this is the example of blind sight. Um, so here we have a living room that looks like an obstacle course. There are tables all over, the chairs all over, the rugs that you can trip on um, and so forth. And you see this man sitting on the, the couch on the right hand side, the things in front of him, and there's a door on the left. And this man is asked to go to the other room. Maybe there's food there for people to eat or people to meet there. And he says, but I can't see. Nevertheless, he gets up and walks through the door, through the door, avoiding all the obstacles. What's going on? So what I'd like to do is give you a very high level explanation using the CTM. So what's happening is the person or the CTM is getting input from the external world, from the eye to the vision processor, maybe from uh, the ear to the hearing, and that gets maybe linked over to the vision processor. And um, the vision processor is working perfectly well and it's sending its messages to a walk actuator and the guy gets up and walks across the room. But the connection to the short-term memory from the vision processor is either non-existent or broken. And so without ex access to STM from vision, he has no conscious sense that he can see. I'd like to end my part of this uh, presentation by saying a few words about the extended mind. Um, in 98, Andy Clark and David Chalmers talks about the extended mind. And basically what they're saying is, our mind is much more than what's inside our head. Um, we make use of libraries, books, information from Google and so forth. So we have, you, we utilize a whole lot of other things in the outside world as part of our mind and our mental processes. So we also say there is an extended conscious Turing machine, and that's in fact what we're really looking at is the extended conscious Turing machine, where we can make use now in the long-term memory processes of all the current wonderful technology there is. So besides our model of the world and our inner speech and our vision processors, we might have Google processors we work with, with from Alpha, Siri, Alpha Zero, and whatever comes along. So we believe also this conscious Turing machine will be able to utilize all the technology and great stuff that everybody's doing these days. So with that, I turn it over to Manuel, who will talk in part two. Thank you. Thank you, Lenore. Uh, let's make some points before we begin. Uh, the CTM is a formalization of BARS global theater model. We think it's an extraordinarily insightful model for explaining consciousness. But it's not formally defined. Its definition is vague. It says that audience members decide among themselves who has the information that should get to the stage but does not say how to decide that. As an undergraduate in Dr. Warren S. McCulloch's neurophysiology lab, I learned that in the Navy, the ship that has the information commands the fleet. An important principle that, but what exactly does it mean? The same question comes up in the theater model. In the theater model, every processor has information to send to the stage, the information is a gist that the processor tags with a numerical weight. The absolute value of the weight indicates the importance and expected correctness of the gist. That's decided, determined by the processor that creates the gist. Probably the processor will make mistakes, it'll get corrected. The sign of the weight indicates if the gist is positive or negative, the weight of a gist is an important factor in deciding if the gist gets to the stage. Let's see how the CTM does this. The probabilistic CTM. There are two models of CTM, the deterministic CTM and the probabilistic CTM. The probabilistic CTM, for many reasons, turns out to be the simpler, better model. The only difference between the two models 
is that the probabilistic CTM uses a coin flip neuron in every node of the uptree. Aside from that randomness, the probabilistic CTM is totally deterministic. So what's a coin flip neuron? It's a device that takes as input an ordered pair of non-negative real numbers A and B, and in one step does the following. If A plus B is greater than zero, it outputs A with probability A over A plus B, else it outputs B. If A plus B equals zero, it outputs A with probability one half. Here's a picture of the coin flip neuron. And we assume that every node of the uptree at every level of the tree above the level of the processors has a coin flip neuron. Now for the probabilistic competition algorithm. Let F be an uptree competition function. This means that F maps chunks to non-negative real numbers where chunks, you recall, a chunk is a six tuple consisting of an address of the processor that created the chunk, the time it got created, the gist, which is a small amount of information that's carried by the chunk, the weight of that gist being the, um, the, the value of that gist, uh, the intensity being the absolute value of that weight, and the mood being the weight itself. As the chunk moves up, it will turn out that the address, time, gist, and weight will move up unchanged, but the intensity and mood do change. The address, time, gist, and weight of the chunk associated with V is decided probabilistically. The red chunk, red, um, the red child, red child on the left, chunk sub L, goes up a level with probability given by the, its F value divided by the sum of the F values of the red and blue nodes. And if red doesn't go up, then, B, then the right blue uh, chunk goes up. Choosing VL, the left child, means putting its address, time, gist, and weight into V. Choosing the right child means putting its address, time, gist, and weight into V. The other two parameters, intensity and mood, of the chunk associated with V are computed very simply. Intensity in V will be the sum of the intensities of the two children, and the mood in V will be the sum of the two moods of its children. Here's a simple example to show it, how this works. Let F be an additive function, F of X Additive means that f of x plus y equals f of x plus f of y. Suppose that f of the left chunk, the red chunk, is 3, and f of the blue chunk is 1.7. Then with probability 3 divided by 3 plus 1.7, f selects the left chunk, else it selects the right chunk. And you can see in this picture, there's the left chunk on the left side of the slide the blue chunk on the right side and above them the parent the pa in this particular case f has chosen the left one to move up and so the red address time gist and weight move up but uh, the intensity both intensities sum to move up both moods get summed to move up here's the theorem the probabilistic competition gives every processor P a fraction of time in short-term memory that is proportional to the F value of its chunk. If, for example, LTM has four processors, A, B, C, D, with F values 1, 3, 2, 4, respectively, then B will get a fraction of time in short-term memory that is given by 3 divided by the sum of the F values, 1 plus 3 plus 2 plus 4, or three tenths. So every every one of these uh, gists gets up there a fraction of the time in short-term memory proportional to uh, its F value. In this way, the environment see the environment is one of the uh, chunks. A description of the environment is one of the chunks that's 
looking to get up into FCM. And so in this way, the environment actually ma maintains a presence in SCM. Uh, it, it has a small probability of getting up there. Here's an example of how that theorem is proved. We have here the GIS A, B, C, D and with their F values, one, three, two, four. If you look at B, you can look at any one of these GIS, let's look at B. Um, B has F value three, and so the probability that it moves up one level is what three divided by one plus three. And then the probability that it moves up from there will be one plus three divided by one plus three plus two plus four. And when you multiply these probabilities together, you get that the probability of B will be three tenths. It'll be its F value divided by the sum of the F values of all the uh, just at, at the leaves. Here's theorem 2.2. Let F be an additive competition function. Then for all P and T, the probability that P wins the competition that began at time T is F of the chunk divided by the sum of F of chunks. That's what the theorem that we just spoke about. Here's theorem 2.3. Let F be any additive competition function, then for all P and T, the probability that chunk generated by P at time T at the level of the processor is zero, reaches STM at the time T plus H, the time it takes to move up a tree of height H, is independent of the location of the processor or any other processors equivalently the permutation chosen to assign processors to leaves of the uptree have no effect on the sequence of broadcasts from STM. You can move those processors around and the broadcast from STM will remain unchanged. It can be shown that these theorems 2.2 and 2.3 fail for every competition function that is not additive. Our preferred competition functions well, a simple additive competition function is F of chunk equal to intensity. In our view, the best two additive competition functions are F of chunk equal to intensity plus one half the mood and F of chunk equal to intensity minus one half the mood. Uh, one of these takes a more positive view of life. The other takes a more negative view of life. They both have the desirable properties at first they are additive, and secondly, they permit positive and negative moods to cancel. Uh, without going into the proof, this is clear when the two chunks are placed as siblings in the competition tree, and more generally, by theorem 2.3, modifying the placement of the two chunks, no matter where they are to be siblings, will have no effect on the content of short term memory. And that's because these permutations have no effect. Let's look at consciousness. Consciousness in the CTM is defined as awareness of the content of short-term memory, that's STM, by long-term memory, LTM. In the CTM, all hard work is done by the processors, all of which operate unconsciously in LTM. Assuming CTM is a good model for human consciousness, we are conscious of only the gist that is in STM, no more, no less. What is that gist of which you are conscious? It is always one of five things, an inner voice articulating your thoughts, an inner image, a sensation, a feeling, a wordless thought. That's interesting, what's a wordless thought? Like a word that's on the tip of your tongue. You know what you want, you just don't have a word for it. That's it. Consciousness in the model is defined to be the contents of short-term memory. That leaves open the question, what gives rise to the feeling of consciousness? Possible answers. First, all LTM processors know what's in STM. So if 
any one processor is responsible for that feeling of consciousness, it knows what's in STM. Some LTM processors are particularly responsible for consciousness, such as the inner dialogue processors. In humans, these processors include an inner speech processor that translates all speech in STM's brainish into an inner speech akin to what the ear hears from the external world, an inner vision processor. Brainish here is the language of the brain. And thirdly, what, what gives rise to the feeling of consciousness, the richness of the language of the brain. What we call brainish is much richer than English. Think of the richness of dreams, the images, sounds, feelings in these dreams are practically indistinguishable from the real thing. You can be in great pain in the dream and wake up with no pain. You can be in bed facing up in the dream and wake up facing down. All the images, sounds, and feelings in a dream are stored in brainish in your brain. You feel them as real because they are essentially the same gist that describe your world when you are awake. And fourth, the model of the world processor, which maintains models of the environment. It has several important jobs, including generating and recalling maps of CTM's world, distinguishing self from not self in those worlds, predicting actions of self and not self in its worlds, planning actions in the environment. What does consciousness do for CTM? Through broadcasts from STM, it focuses LTM processors on generating the current best interpretation of the world. And it serves as a checker on that interpretation. It presents a sketch of what should be focused on in the world. And secondly, consciousness gives the entity, the CTM, the ability to solve unanticipated problems, to deal with a complex world using all the tools at its disposal. Now for our big question, will the CTM have the feeling that it is conscious? Yes or no? We believe that yes, but how do we prove that a CTM feels conscious? We don't. The reasonableness of our definition of consciousness lies entirely in the explanation it gives for consciousness the extent to which those explanations agree with our intuitive feelings about our own consciousness, the range of concepts that the CTM explains easily and naturally, and the CTM's response to situations unforeseen by CTM's creator. Why? Here are some concepts explainable with the CTM. Why is short-term memory so tiny? One, it ensures that all LTM processors pay attention to the same conscious thought. If STM contained gist from many processors, it would be unlikely for them all to focus on the same thought. How is a math proof understood? When you have fully understood a math proof, you feel you have its entirety in your hand. What you actually have is a gist, the idea of the proof, with pointers to its definitions and lemmas. How do LTM processors decide what signs to give their weights? In an infant, hunger and pain are negative. Food and love are positive. The infant's signs are built in. Later in life, if sign is not obvious, it can be taken to be that of the current mood. How are the feelings of pain and pleasure to be explained? We are not talking about the knowledge of pain and pleasure. We are talking about the feeling of pain and pleasure. Just because pain is negative and pleasure is positive does not imply that CTM will feel pain and pleasure. So what does make CTM feel pain and pleasure? This brings us to the easy and hard problems. Our formulation, the easy problem, make a robot that simulates feelings like those of pain and joy. The hard problem, make a robot that truly experiences feelings like those of pain and joy. Why the particular interest in pain and joy? Well, first, pain and joy are among the hardest feelings to explain. 
They are hard to explain scientifically. We need a test for pain, something better than the doctor's test. The pain opioid crisis begs for insight. But the primary thing is, what's the explanation, the scientific explanation to be for creating the feelings of pain and joy? Let's distinguish between simulation and experience. In the disorder called pain asymbolia, the patient knows she has pain, but does not suffer. Adults who get pain asymbolia from a concussion know what pain is, claim they still have pain, but say it's nothing. It no longer bothers them. The robots we build are pain asymbolic. We know how to make them appear to be in pain, but we don't know how to make them feel the pain. So how might the conscious Turing machine experience pain? We tried many explanations. Here are suggestions that cannot be the answer. As attested to by type two pain as symbolics who, who cry out. Pain might arise from observing unconscious reactions such as grimacing, crying out and such, response to painful situations such as a finger pulling away from a flame, sweat and increased heart rate, muscles that vibrate, and so on. Since type two asymbolics don't feel pain, but do have all of these reactions, these reactions cannot account for the feeling of pain. We're looking for an explanation that doesn't depend on chemicals, that works as well for machines made of silicon and gold as they do for those made of flesh and blood. We have three suggestions for extreme pain, only three. First, broadcast. Extreme pain is an actor that takes over all short-term memory. It prevents all other actors, chunks, from reaching the stage. Pain messages and only pain messages are broadcast. Every processor knows of the pain. With few exceptions, nothing else can get into STM. And there's confirmation. Under conditions that normally cause agony, pain as symbolics can think, while normals cannot. In a Darwinian design, you might expect pain to lead to constructive thinking, but agony actually interferes with constructive thinking. It forces you to rely on your unconscious self. However, while broadcasts account for some pain, they do not account for the sudden excruciating pain at the moment you tear a ligament. What does? Interrupts. Sudden extreme pain, a finger touching a burning stove, interrupts all unconscious processors. Interrupts, as opposed to broadcasts, cause processors to instantly put their work on a stack, forces them to pay their maximum immediate attention to the interrupt. This differs from broadcasts which send their information to processors without forcing them to put what they're doing on a stack. And thirdly, concentration on pain reduces pain, but lets fear take its place in STM. Concentration on fear reduces fear, but lets pain take its place in STM. It's a vicious cycle. It's not just the pain that hurts. Your mind can start to suffer as you desperately try to find a way of escaping. Pointed and bitter questions can begin nagging at your soul. What will happen if I don't recover? What if it gets worse? I can't cope with this. Next up is the hard problem for pleasure. Lenore will say some words about that. Thank you, Manuel. I've been interested in exploring the hard problem for the feeling of pleasure. As I mentioned, there are a number of neuroscientists who work in this area, Berridge and Kringlebach, Lechnis and Tracy. Uh, so what I'd like to do is give you a sense of the direction we're going here. So what is pleasure? For example, it's a mother's love. It's also the alleviation of pain. Early on, a child or the CTM knows, either because it's built in or by experience, that negative moods are to be avoided. 
they also learn that they can lessen a negative mood by seeking a positive mood. On the other hand, they do not learn in general to avoid positive moods. In this way, positive and negative moods are not symmetric. So we hypothesize the system such as CTM built to attain homeostasis via its inherent predictive dynamics, which I talked about, will have a feeling of pleasure and well being in the quest and attainment of that goal. We will be exploring this further. Now back to Manuel. Which LTM processors are not needed for consciousness? Which LTM processors are needed for consciousness? Most LTM processors are not needed for consciousness. For example, vision and hearing. Helen Keller lost both vision and hearing, but was nevertheless conscious. Face recognition. Lesions in the fusiform face area can affect face recognition to the point that patients with this disorder don't even recognize their own family or themselves. Danger warning processor. SM had a calcified amygdala. She felt no fear, none. Civilizing processor. Phineas Gage lost his entire prefrontal cortex, but he was conscious. Declarative memory. Facts, general knowledge, personal experiences, processors. HM lost all ability to make permanent declarative memories. Curiously, he could still make procedural memories. He was conscious, even though he could not make memories. Procedural memory? Um, don't know. Most LTM processors are not needed for consciousness. You can see here in the middle is Phineas Gage with the iron that went through his skull, completely destroying both sides, both left and right prefrontal cortex. He went on to uh, drive a six horse carriage in Chile, an, amazing, uh, an amazingly difficult thing to do. And he was conscious. Some LTM processors essential for consciousness. One, inner dialogue processors for transforming brainish into something akin to outer speech and vision for commenting, planning, etc. You need to have that in order to do stuff. Inner dialogue processors. A model of the world processor for distinguishing self from not self. Here's a, a baby who is discovering uh, its left leg. You can hear the pairs in the background. Baby's really amazed. He looks over to his right leg. Can I do it with that? But he can do it with his left leg. Pretty wonderful. So inner dialogue processors, a model of the world processor for distinguishing self from not self. I guess that's, that was the baby. If Yoda's brain is a CTM, then Yoda is conscious of the rock as self. So it just, he just has to think it moving up and down. Some minimal ability to think, including the motivation, the energy and drive to do it. You know Gordon Gallup's mirror test for self-awareness. It captures the three requirements for consciousness. The test is one in which you put some rouge on the child's forehead and then you let it see itself in the mirror. And if the child sees the mark and recognizes it's on itself and tries to get rid of it, then it's said to be self-aware. It means that the child has to have a model of the world for distinguishing self from not self, tries to remove the rouge from itself, not from the child in the mirror. It has to have the ability to plan to move that hand up there 
and it has to have the ability to think, including the motivation and the energy to do it. Do elephants pass the mirror test for self-awareness? Again, you have to first let the elephant see itself in a very big mirror. Uh, very important. It got to recognize itself and then if it tries to remove that X, it's self-aware. It has that model of the world for distinguishing self from not self, the inner dialogue for planning, and uh, the motivation and the energy to do this. How about children? Do children pass the mirror test? At age two, they don't. This kid may be two and a half or three years old. Let's see what happens here. Hmm. Not there. There. How about dogs? Do dogs pass the test for self-awareness? Uh, not the mirror test because eyesight is not a dog's strong point, but there's a sniff test that the dog passes. I don't know about cows or octopus. How about a fish? Can a fish pass the test? There's a, a fish called the cleaner wrasse. It's a small fish that you can buy and put into your saltwater aquarium. And this fish does the very strange thing when it's first put in front of a mirror. It does this movement up and down that I've never seen before. And it'll even turn upside down and swim in front of the mirror to check that yes, what's in the mirror is a, is a copy of itself. And then you put some red stuff on its chin and when it sees that red stuff, it goes off to a rock, rubs it off, and goes back to check if it succeeded. How about an ant? Can an ant pass the test for self-awareness? There's a species of ant called Myrmica. Uh, it's a genus of ant. Myrmica, there are three species. And uh, when any of the, all three pass the test, when they uh, see, uh, themselves in the mirror, they walk right up on the mirror, they see themselves, they see the mark that's been placed on its forehead, and then they try to rub it off and then look back into the mirror to check if it's there. So we view this test for self-awareness as being a pretty good test for also for consciousness. Thank you all. And now Lenore will sum up our views on consciousness. As stated in part one, our view of consciousness is that it is a property of all properly organized computing systems, whether made of flesh and blood or metal and silicon. Our thesis is that it is the architecture of these systems and key processors that are able to communicate thoughts, plans, images, and sensations in an expressive inner language and the dynamics of prediction feedback and learning that makes them conscious. So this is the end of the presentation. Thank you for listening. Manuel and I would appreciate your feedback, your comments and questions. Uh, you can email us and we will have the slides and draft of the paper uh, posted. Also, after this last slide, we will have um, a list of homework problems which suggest open problems and possible directions for research. We also have a list of references, things we found very useful. Obviously it's not comprehensive, but it's a really good place to start. So take care everyone and thank you again. Bye-bye.